All right, let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, be with us, Father, as we fight for this. Uh, we have tons of delays, but Father, you are on time. The enemy is fighting us hard right now. He's fighting our minds and our bodies and our hearts because he doesn't want us to touch the people around the world that you've been touching with this church, God. So, Father, I pray right now that you will just move and that you will just stir, prepare, make things work the way you desire it to work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Welcome to this amazing, amazing, amazing um, session that we're going to be having today. Um, it's called Ten Commandments for Modern Day Christians. It is our absolute last time that we're going through. Uh, so it's the end, I should say. It's a better way of saying it. It's the end of our series on Moses, right? And we've been going through Exodus. We've been going through all the different chapters. And um, we left off, and we covered a lot of different things, but we left off last week on a sermon that was incredibly popular. We're talking about um, in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Turkey, in Africa, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Ghana, in Ethiopia. This gospel, this message that God's been giving us has been just going all over the place. So... And the first thing God says is, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other gods before me. So the, what you have to figure out is, what does this mean? Right? This is that first command. The absolute first one. Right? And I want to break this down to see if you can get how does this fit in with everything else all right so this very very first one right this is what we're talking about if you want to understand what god is saying here is this is in the large large ocean of people in your life where is god is he um way back there Behind all of the people in your life, you know, your kids, your family, or all these different people, or is he number one? And when, when we talk about this, there's a lot of people who say, um, I'm Jamaican, or I am uh, Vietnamese, or I, I am Belize, I am Ethiopian, I am Nigerian, I am Filipino, this is my culture, right? Well... If God is not before your culture, then your culture is God and number one. You can have a relationship with God and that relationship with God not actually have him in that number one spot. So that's where God is saying, I need to be in the number one spot. I cannot be one of the things that is important to you, I have to actually be number one. That is a really big deal to God, which is why he made it his very first thing. Too often in our lives, we, we actually put our culture and our thoughts and our, and our family members and our loved ones before God, but God says, no, I have to be number one. One, that's the first one. Let's move to the second one. Now, this second one seems to trick a lot of people, right? Um, especially today. He says, you must um, not make for yourself any idols of any kinds of images in the heavens or in the earth or the sea. And you must not bow down and worship them, for I am the Lord thy God, I'm a jealous God. So here is what we miss with this. What we miss with this is we're like, obviously this isn't for us today because we don't have idols, right? And I, and I find that so funny and so ironic because it says, don't create anything that you end up worshiping. So what is worship? Worship is bowing down. That's what it is. It's, it's to surrender yourself to something. Today, the number one man-made object that people bow down and worship, I need you to see this. Look, look, look up at this. 
What, what, what are they doing here? They are bowing down and worshiping money. Money is made by man. And right now, most people make almost all of their life decisions based on how this God called money wants them to function. If, if they will get more money working a certain job that they hate than a job that they love, a lot of people will go do the job they hate simply because it pays more money. I see these like YouTube pranks all the time, right? And one of the things that I always found funny about these YouTube pranks, there would be this guy that's dressing all bummish, and he comes up to this girl that is just looking amazing. She's beautiful. She's young. She looked like a whole bunch of stuff going on for her, and nothing's going on for him. And he's like, hey, can I get your number? Can we talk? And she just brushes him off like, no, dude, get away from me. So then he goes into like this $500,000 sports car and she sees him in the car and she stops, turns around and go back and talk to him. What just happened? What just changed? It's the same guy, right? Except now she says, oh no, he has money. Guys do the same thing. There's a lot of guys who make all their decisions about their value and their worth. Who am I? What do I have to contribute? If I don't have a good job or if I don't have money, if I don't dress nice or have jewelry or have a big house, then I am nobody because my worth is defined by the idol I worship and this idol is dollars and bills. God says, do not worship idols. In Moses' days, they had the bull, that the calf that they made. In the U.S. today, they have what's called the bull market, which means the stock and investments, the portfolio, the economy is doing well. Are we still worshiping this today? The answer is yes. We're still worshiping the bull today. Number three. Now, this one might seem like, like a little surprising to you, right? Um, but here is the thing. The number one thing a lot of people dislike about Christians, really, at the end of the day, is uh, most Christians are kind of fake. I mean, you know, hypocritical, right? You know, you, you'll meet some Christian people and, and they seem to, like, be really nice and sweet if you catch them at the right church time, but not necessarily that way before church or after church. Like, I used to remember, man, I used to remember how, like, the, all the drama and the stress and the problems and the angriness and the shouting, are you ready, and the meanness, getting to the church building, all right? And then sometimes arguing in the car, but you, you close the car door and you start walking towards the church, and you're like, hey, and everything is good. You're happy now. Everything is good. But it's not, all right? Um, one of the things I actually like about a lot of people who, who um, are just in the world is they're more authentic sometimes. You know, you know what you're getting. Well, this is actually a big deal to God. And here's why. God rather you be in the world and say, I am in the world, than to say, I am a Christian. I represent God, my Father. If you want to know what God is like, look at me but then you are still functioning like you are in the world. So it becomes, who do you want to be today? Are you going to be each day with God, who you're supposed to be, or will you have two faces? All right, so next slide, let's see. So do you have two faces? So which face are you going to wear, right? Are you going to be the, I am a happy, everything is cool, the Bible says so, so I am good, right? Or are you going to be worried and, and have the same anxieties everybody else in the world has? Which face will you have? God is very big on this, that you should not carry his name and not be transformed by him. If you are watching the exact same TV shows before you gave your life to God, like after, something is wrong there, right? 
in most cases. Not always, but I would challenge you on that. If you're, you dress the exact same after you met God than you did before, I would challenge you on that. I'm not telling you what to wear, but God should be influencing your decisions in some way. Because when you carry his name, you have to represent the name you carry, right? And this is what God is talking about when he says this. And so it'd be better if you're a Christian and you're struggling to, this might sound crazy, to openly struggle in front of everybody. To say, you know what? I'm a Christian, but I don't have it all together. I'm a Christian. And I am in desperate need of God every day. That is now being authentic, and that is carrying God's name in an authentic way. With a dependence on God, say, I know I'm still struggling with this today, but if you will just wait, you'll see God change me in this area. So that's what that looks like today for us. And not everybody is ready for this. Not everybody kind of wants to go there. But I'm telling you, this stuff applies today. And I want to pause and tell you something. The first four commandments is our relationship to God. You will not be able to do any of this yourself. If you're thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know if I can have money not be God in my life where all my decisions is made how, about money. You know, will I get some? Will I not get some? Right? Or, or my culture. You know, hey, this is just my Estonian way or my Jamaican way or, or my Vietnamese way or my Kenyan way. Right? You know, right? If you're not sure you have the, the, the strength to do that, here's the thing. You probably don't. But here's what I can tell you, that if you learn how to lean on God and surrender to him, this is what he will produce in you. You will become that person that makes God first. You will become that person who carries his name in a way that he approves. You will become that person who can always only say, God is God for me. My culture is second. My money decisions are second. My family is second. God is first. He's the only God in my life, right? And so now we're going to move on to the fourth. And this fourth one, um, this fourth one stumbles up a lot of people, right? And, it's, and it's, it's, it's not that hard. It says, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes now your son, your daughter, your male or female servant. Basically, anybody in your house that is working on the Sabbath is violating the Sabbath. Right? If you are the head of the house... You're not supposed to sit by and casually watch people in the house work on the Sabbath, all right? So you go, well, I get that, you know, for those Jewish people way back in the day, that makes sense. Um, you know, I find it interesting that Stephen Covey that writes 10 Habits of Successful People, right? One of the habits he has for success is this thing called a weekly day of rest. He found that people who actually took a weekly day of rest were more successful in their lives than people who did not. This is just how it works. Um, unlike monthly calendars and seasons, there is no celestial stars and moon alignments that influence the creation of a seven-day week. It's created only by God himself, right? And so here's what God is saying. God is saying that you need a day dedicated to resting. Now, remember I said the first four commandments is your relationship to God, right? Here's what God is saying to you. He doesn't want your what's left. He doesn't want your, after the week has beat you up and you're stressful and stressed out, that whatever you got left in the tank, the fumes of energy and time and devotion and focus is what you give to him. So he's like, I'm going to talk to you after your third or fourth nap. I'm going to wait until you are so well rested that you will have the time and energy to really connect with me. 
He says, I'm, I'm making it law that you will just cut off your, your busyness for one day. That is not an easy thing to do, though, because we tend to want to go, 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 go. And we stayed so plugged in with work and stress and school. It's like we barely ever give ourselves a break. I remember I shared this story with my sister. I told her, you're going to appreciate the Sabbath when you get into college in a way that you can never appreciate it otherwise. And she was like, you know, looking at me kind of strange, but then she got it, right? Working and going to school at the same time means the only time you're doing neither and you can just rest, sleep, relax, nap, eat some food, let it all go, is Sabbath. Now, if you want to know more about this, I actually wrote a book on it. So I'm going to put the book in this actual um, sermon so that in the links in it, um, you'll be able to watch that. Um, if you go to rawintimacy.com, rawintimacy.com, you'll find out a little bit more information on that, all right? So we're going to now transition from the, the how God is looking at us doing Sabbath, right, um, and putting him first, right, um, making him God of your life right? The first four commandments between us and him to the fifth, from five to ten, we're now going to cover what does it look like today for us to be walking in the commandments of God in our relationship with each other. Now, this first one seems simple. I used to interpret this one that says you should listen to your mom and dad and do whatever they say. Because that's how it was interpreted to me when I was a kid. That is not at all what the Bible says. Did you know that? It says, honor your father and mother, then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God has given you. It doesn't say anywhere in there you have to like your parents. There is no commandment to like them. You can totally hate their guts all your life and not violate this commandment. You can disagree with them on every single topic and not violate this commandment. But here's what you don't have the option to do. Whether your parents were good or very evil, twisted, abusive people, God is commanding you to honor them above you obeying them. Because if they're asking you to do something wrong, you shouldn't obey them. Why? What was the first command? That God would be the only Lord of your life, right? And if God is Lord of your life and they ask you to do something wrong, then you say no. So check this out. So I remember um, I just got saved, right? I became a Christian. And as I got saved and became a Christian, um, in my house at the time, we, we still had that thing called a house phone. All right, sorry for those of you that don't know what that is, but we had a house phone. And when the house phone rang, um, they all, my parents would always tell me my, um, to, you know, pick up the phone. Um, and so that was kind of me and my brother's job. We were like the answering service, the dishwashers, and the, the, the grass cutters, right? So the, the, the phone rings, pick up the phone, and it was like, ring, ring, dee, dee. okay, I pick up the phone. So somebody for one of my parents. To protect their identity, I'm not going to say which one. So, um, ring, ring. And so I was like, hey, uh, I started saying the person was here. But then my parents start shouting in the back and waving and giving me all the signs. I'm not here. I'm not here. And so I was like, here she is. <laughs> Yeah, my parent was really mad at me. Uh, She's pretty mad at me, like really mad at me about this. Um, but the problem with that is this. Uh, I had just given my life to God, and I had promised God I wasn't going to lie. And so even though they wanted me to say, hey, you know, I'm not here, I honored God more than I honored them because I followed that first command was God was first. And so, yeah, I got in you know, trouble and yelled at for it. But then once I said, hey, but that's lying, they thought about it, and then they went, oh, Okay, and I didn't get in trouble anymore. Honor your parents is one of the only things that God gives as a command where he promises 
that he will prosper you in your life on earth if you do this. Honoring your parents means that based on whatever age relationship you have with them, that you will always honor the authority that God has given them in your life. So when you're a child, they've given, God given them the authority to oversee you. So you don't have to agree with your parents, but they're in a place of authority in your life. So you have to honor that authority and you have to follow what they say as long as it doesn't conflict with the word of God. When you become a teenager, you get this rebellious nature where you want to feel and test out the boundaries. So you start violating this pretty easy because your instincts and your desires are, I just want to do what I want to do, how I want to do it. I want to learn my mistakes and, and make all of my decisions. It's my life. It's not your life, blah, blah, blah. But the problem with that is your parents were teenagers before you were, and they're guiding you to so you can avoid some of the pains that they had, right? When the relationship changes and that you're now an adult and they're an adult, this command still stands. You still have to honor them, but now they are not in a position of authority over your life like when you were a child. So you don't have to listen to them for everything they say, but you have to honor them, which the Bible references when the New Testament talks about honoring them. This gets into you have to make sure you give them what they need if it's within your ability. If they need food and you have food, you have to give them food. You can still not like them. You guys can still not be on speaking terms. You can't allow them to go hungry. If they need clothes, you have to give them clothes. Notice I didn't say want. They might want some like really expensive luxury clothes. You don't have to give them that. But here's what you can't do. You can't neglect their needs, none of their needs. Their needs for safety, for shelter. Their needs are always going to be something you must honor as a child, as an adult child to your parent. That's how God views this, and that's what we're at today. So if you're just going to become an adult and live independent of your parents and never call them, you can get away with not calling them. But if they need you, you can't get away from not showing up. Let's move on to number six. So now number six is, is, I don't think this one is hard for us to get, but I thought for the longest time it was just saying don't kill, and I had a hard time with it. Like what if a mosquito comes and bites you, right? Don't you want to smack it and kill it? You know, I was scared of snakes for a long time. So if I saw a snake, my instinct was I'm killing it. I don't care if that snake is a benefit to the environment. It's, it wasn't to my life, and I killed it, right? Um, I, I've seen this, this particular command get twisted so far out of what God was trying to say. What God is saying here is this. The difference between killing someone and murder um, is there are times that God says the death of somebody is justified and he approves it. He very rarely ever justifies a person killing another person because he says the image, the body of each of us re represents him. And when you attack the body of another person, you are attacking the image of God himself. And he takes offense to that. However, God authorized governments to enact justice against criminals and against people who do wrong. And you find this endorsed over and over again in the Bible, Old and New Testament, because God wants to make sure that there is a system of fairness that also includes punishing, even to death, a wrong person who does evil acts. Today, we have people who've gotten cold-hearted about this. Like, I find it strange today how the most popular video games have you holding a gun or weapon of some sort, and you go and you kill, stab, shoot, electrocute, 
magically jolt, blow up the enemy or other person. And so now our entertainment, right, is, uh, is asking us to take a controller and act out murder multiple times a day for hours until we become numb to it. Our entertainment on TV is constantly showing the good guy always murders somebody, kills them, yeah, hopefully in, in self-defense or hopefully, you know, in a, in a way that God could approve. But we are living in a world and a time where we're becoming numb to life. God is always considerate precious. Your life is precious to God. He doesn't want you bruised, beaten, or hurt. And he doesn't want us to use his Bible to justify or hide anyone that does hurt. Now, here's what's crazy. When you look at history, a lot of people have used the Bible itself as an instrument to kill, maim others under a Christian banner has been done a tremendous amount of things that God never endorsed. But keep in mind, it was, a, it was a, a God's own people who crucified God when he walked the earth, right? It wasn't some strangers. It was his people, his set-apart people who didn't have a right relationship with God, who didn't recognize God when he came and put on flesh and healed and preached. And so because they didn't recognize God in that moment, they killed their Savior. This is how we function today. A lot of our answers to our problems in life is another person. That's how God works. When you pray for something, God will stir somebody to come answer that prayer. If you kill the people, you're killing off the instruments that God uses to show his love. Here's another one that's rather common. Now this one, when you look at this, this scenario um, is like every soap opera that I've ever seen on TV, right? Every, like, uh, every really dramatic show has some level of infidelity tied to it. And it, it's getting into the place today where people are like, you know, being committed to one person, that's just stupid. That's just crazy. And we are so foreign to a lot of what's going on. But here are some things I need you to get about what's going on here. I know our society has said that sex is a really casual thing. But you are physically and mentally connected to this person. Scientists, I came across this last year, this blew my mind. Scientists found genetic DNA in the brains of women that weren't theirs. And they were confused. They were like, how did that happen? How did, what, what, what caused this? And guess what happened? Through sexual intercourse, the, the DNA of the guy they had sex with was absorbed into their bodies and made it to their brains. Literally, guy on the brain, right? I'm saying to you that there is more going on in this than you believe. And when you engage or in, in sexual acts with somebody, that is not your forever person. This is not the person God has for you. You now have attachments that don't break that easily. And God is like, he cares about your heart and your body. And he wants you to have the best not just okay, he wants you to have the best. And so, yes, we're living in a world that says you can just have friends with benefits and you can hook up, and it's okay as long as everybody can sense. But what God has always said is that there's always more going on than just two people pleasing each other sexually. And I want you to be, be aware of the setup so that your heart is unattached when you are now in a committed relationship. Number eight. Now, this one should be easy for us, I think, right? Because a lot of people are really scared of this type of identity theft stuff, right? Um, we think like stealing stuff, you know, 
Most people, most people think they're a good person even if they stole a movie. Here's what I mean by that. Let's break down what stealing is. Right? Who, whoever owns something, if they didn't give you permission to use it or take it, and you take it without permission, you just stole it. So if a guy doesn't have permission, he has sex with a girl, he didn't just rape her, he stole from her, her body, right? If, now I'm gonna give you another example. If the person who created the movie didn't give you permission to watch the movie, then your bootleg DVD, online site, whatever version of it that you have was stealing. We don't think of it always that way. We justify it like it's okay, it's not a big deal, it's not hurting anybody. And we make peace with it ourselves. But what I want you to understand is whether it's criminal stealing your identity online or you going online to steal people's products, in God's eyes, when you take things that is not yours, that is not how God wants you to function. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to remind you of this. If you think you have the strength to do this right all the time, I'm telling you, you don't. These commands, right, that I'm walking you through today, these commands are not within your ability to do 100% of the time. But if you surrender to God, you will become a person who will say, you know what, I'll pay for it. I'd rather pay for that movie than I'd steal it. Why? I just want to be right with God in my, in my approach to Him. And God will find all the ways to give you those things that you, that you want. Right? Now, I'll give you another one. Right? We're going to switch to um, from 8 to 9. And it's this lion thing. I remember as a teenager, I, was, I, was, I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have a car. Uh, my clothes was like always a knockoff of whatever the designer clothes was. Um, and I was like my friends. We were always trying to find like, you know, girls to, you know, you know, trying to get a girl and impress her and stuff. So I just did what me and my friends did. We just used to lie. We used to just look them right in the eye and be like, yeah, I'm going to go take you shopping. Yeah. Can we go on a date first? And after the date, we'll go shopping. And they were like, okay, yeah, I'm going to buy you whatever you want. And then I'll find a reason to like be like, hey, um, you know, uh, something came up. So after our date, I got to go. <laughs> right? It's funny how you think you have to lie to get things or lie to save somebody's feelings or, or lie to get ahead. But what I'm going to say to you is this. God has built the world, right, in such a way that truth will get you more than a lie ever will. And here's the thing about lies. Lies have the ability to destroy the very things you value. You value relationships more than you value things, even though you don't treat everyone you have a relationship with well. But lies is a killer of relationships. And if you ever want to have a good relationship with a friend, with a coworker, with a teacher, with a loved one, with a parent, it's you have to get into a habit of speaking the actual truth. Which means if somebody cooked some food and they spent a lot of energy and time in it, you have to be willing to say, "Yeah, I didn't like it. I mean, I I like you, but honestly, I didn't like the food." And then they, they might not be happy with you in the moment, but they will love and respect you because you were somebody who spoke the truth to them. And now they'll make the adjustments so next time the food won't be nasty. Just saying. Help everybody out. Let's all eat good by, you know, telling the truth. All right? So lies. Number 10. Okay. This is, I, I'm sorry, this is my pet peeve. I went to school for marketing, right? So there's five P's of marketing, product, place, price, and promotions, right? Marketing is trying to get you to buy their products whether you want it or not. So here's the first thing they do. They tell you that if you 
just have this car, life would be so amazing. If you just have this cookie, if you just eat this burger, if you just buy this drink, if you just da 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 da, it solves your problem of this, this, this. It doesn't matter if in reality it doesn't. Marketing's job is to sell you the product so they attach, they, they want you to attach emotions to a non-emotional thing. They want you to actually say, I care about this thing emotionally because I'm invested in it, though it's not really in truth able to love you back, right? Some people love their phone, like Samsung. Ooh, yes, I'm passionate about it. It's so much better than iPhone, and they want to argue about this, right? Reebok or Nike or Honda or Toyota or all sorts of stuff we like have this strong loyalty to why because marketers were able to tell you that you should want things you don't have that thing is called covetousness in the bible what the problem is when you see it on tv you get like i think i like that like if a good infomercial will get will tell you a problem you have for sure and present to you the only real solution is this product. And for $19.99, you too can blah, 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 blah. It's almost unfair because you go to the store and you buy the items, right, you, that you want. And when you're checking out, they put stuff you don't want there. You didn't come there for any of that. They put it at eye level. They put it in nice colors. And they put a sale price on it. And you're like, yeah, sure, let me take one of those. You're getting things you don't want. It's hard because industries spend billions of dollars on commercials, on TV, and on radio, on advertisements in stores, all designed to get you to covet things. So you would exchange your time and energy to get it. It's so hard to fight against that. But God is bigger than a multi-billion dollar marketing industry. God wants you to be so grounded in who you are that the things you wear never give you value. Your value was already there before you got that Apple Watch, before you got that Lexus car, before you got an, that whatever it is that you feel so important to get in life. Just be content. That for right now, God has given you exactly what you need. Maybe next week or next month, God will say your needs have increased and he will give you more of something. But you got to learn how to be okay with what you have. Because if you don't become okay with what you have, the problem is you lose the ability to embrace and enjoy right now. I've met so many people, right, where they are so obsessed with what they don't have, they can't enjoy the right now. But when they look back, they miss some of the greatest moments of their lives. They miss their high school years because they were so ready to get out of high school that they never enjoyed high school when they were there. They, they, they miss college, right, because they were so focused on, I got to do this, I got to do that. They, they miss the experiences of it. There's people who never appreciated their parents till their parents died. We got to learn how to live and embrace and value what we have now and not always listen to, I got to have more, I got to do more, I got to get tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Enjoy right now. So this is our journey, folks. We covered the Ten Commandments, right, for modern Christians today. And I'm telling you that thou shall have no other gods before me. And number one, it matters. That you shall not worship idols, it matters. That you should not blaspheme the name of God, it matters. Um, so what I want to make sure we do as we close today is I just want to pray with you. I just want to pray with you that we will actually be able to surrender to God so that these Ten Commandments for modern Christians, that will be your truth and your reality. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything you've done and everything you will do. Father, we do not have the strength to live this out. But Father, you, Lord, you promised to make this become our actual testimony. We don't have to strive to do these things, God. We just have to surrender, 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 surrender to you. And this will become who we are. I thank you, Father, for that. And I pray that you help all of us surrender anew. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to continue to support us. Um, share these videos. Um, thank you, Philippines, for blowing up that last video for um, Nigeria, Ethiopia. L much love to you out there. Um, you can also follow us on YouTube on Raw Intimacy, um, the, um, Raw Intimacy with God. Be blessed and have a great day. See you next week.